Well, hello, Rich. Hi, Matthew. We've, uh, we've had a chance to get to know each other over the last couple of months. Um, we've worked together in a, in a number of capacities, but talking about the software platform that I represent, the one that you're trying to build, but also as, as two people who've been in the software industry, and you then also being in the automotive industry for a long period of time. And we've talked about some of the habits and some of the best practices and some of the challenges that are faced in this. And I think what we'd like to give to the audience today, and we'll leave a little bit of room for a few questions at the end, hopefully, is what are kind of some of the nuggets if we were to derive our individual experiences and bring that to something that others could use in their work, what are those things? Yeah. And I think that's our goal today. What's well, yours? Well, first, thanks, Matthew, for inviting me and giving me a chance to speak and for GitHub and their, their great support of Ford. Um, I think you know, what we want to do today is talk a little bit about you know, what's changing in the software development area around um, IT in general, but specifically IT in the emerging space where we have these these new requirements that are fast, fast moving, and where we have very little, we, we tend to think of these projects as perishable, right? So the notion <laughs> that if you don't get there fast enough, it doesn't matter how good the solution is when you do get there. It's too late. You've missed the opportunity. I'd love to highlight that component once again. It's, it bears repeating that sometimes when we say, oh, it needs to move quickly, it's not just pressure, it's not just a goal to hit it sooner, but that there's a cliff in which delivering past a certain point is irrelevant. Right, exactly. So, you know, what we're trying to do is make sure as we go through these, I'd say that's one point. You have to very rapidly, you know, if you use these new methods, you have to very rapidly get to market. And the other thing you want to do is you want to, to some extent, experiment. You want to use the tooling, the, the software tooling that you have that's different than mechanical tooling or electrical engineering tooling to you know, experiment to some extent, right? So you want to put features into market quickly, mm -hmm. do an A-B test, so to speak, with your customer base, actually, and see how you can adapt to that and move on. And, and we think sort of some, some benefits that you get out of that then is you get some high speed in terms of time to market. You get better connection with what the customer wants. Um, they seem to even like the idea of having input back into the development process and what you get out of it in terms of a finished product. So we think it's kind of a nice, a nice way to approach it, and you, there's a lot of benefits to it. Maybe it doesn't apply to everything. I'm not sure. I don't want my anti-lock brake you know, design to happen that way. But um, you know, in terms of the other types of applications we put together, I think it's, it's a very good fit for what we need to do today. So I like, Rich, a couple of things out of that, that conversation that, again, our audience could derive from this. One is that the consumer experience is shifting. I mean, we all possess right. some form of these, you know, one brand or another. And our expectations are, are shaped because we interact with these things 10, 20, 50, 100 times a day. And we expect our other experiences, the ones that you bring through the Ford products, to, to mirror the velocity of improvements and new features that these devices have, have got us accustomed to. So the challenge that I heard you're up against is how do you bring and match those expectations of the consumers buying your vehicles and services to products that are engineering driven. And I'd like to right. emphasize that word, heavy, physical, mechanical, and sometimes chemical engineering processes. Right. So do you think that we're able to retrain? I have a couple questions down that line for this audience. If they have a discipline of ladies and gentlemen that are working in their space, in that engineering space, is everything moving towards a software live update couple of months to ship expectation or most things? Well, I think a lot of things are moving there. We're, we're even looking at it for some of our embedded software development. I mean, I made a bit of a joke about it a minute ago in terms of embedded software, but we do believe that some of this methodology can be applied there. And I think that what, what is happening is just what you said, the impression of consumers is that if you can't surprise and delight me with something new, I might just move on, right? So we need to take advantage of what we would call minimum viable products, right? Put something out there that we can then iterate against and improve on and use that as a way to, um, you know, engage the consumer more directly. Um, one of the things that uh, we talked about earlier was the difficulty of creating MVPs when you have a very complex environment, you know, in which to operate, right? And, uh, so and on that note, complex, of course, <laughs> you should always have a complex diagram behind you when using that phrase. All right, all right. So, so this is the complex diagram, but what, what that really is at is you know, there are some foundational elements you have to put in place in order to get anything of, of true market scale up and running and, and, and moving forward. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you might say, well, how do you make an MVP out of that, a minimal viable product out of that? And the answer really is you do need to think through some planning work where you need to understand the various components. Um, but you also need to, and you need to construct in such a way that it is um, scalable and can be built out. But you have to realize you don't need to build it all in one day. And you can have many minimum viable products happening kind of at the same time, right? So you have 
MVP at scale. So you can be integrating to partners. Some of these folks on the right are our partners. You can be integrating within your, your mobile app. You can be integrating to your back-end corporate existing systems, mm -hmm. integrating into the vehicle itself. And you can create, to the extent you can, some separation and get those MVPs working in parallel. Now, when you mention MVP, I'd like to dissect this a little bit because we all, in this particular audience, especially at, at TU Auto for a show, are working in a discipline that I find more complex and comes with more historical baggage than, say, a web app that you'd find in San Francisco. So right. people often start by drawing that kind of parallel and say, well, we'd like you to, to have their one-week sprints or their five right. weeks to market kind of pieces, but they don't necessarily have the physical burdens that we do of manufacturing components and bringing those to safety standards or the like. So so my question is, how do you navigate the best of both, manipulating kind of consumer expectations, but still delivering to sometimes the regulatory requirements? How do you navigate both? How do you meet a safety standard and still give them something in a couple months? And how do you motivate your engineers to be able to work in this shorter cycle? Yeah. So, so the one thing is there, there are some hard constraints in terms of safety, regulatory requirements, um, and, and you know, in many respects, complexity, just the complexity of making things happen. So it's going to be very difficult for us to put you know, uh, embedded modems in all of our vehicles in an hour. So we, we, we have to have a plan for rolling that out, and we have to honor sort of our, our existing um, engineering processes to make that happen so we're sure that it's safe and that it works. We'll have the reliability that we want and the th throughput and performance. Um, but you can... You can create those plans. We already know how to do that. We've known how to do that for many years. Um, so it's not hard to get that to happen. What's, what's difficult to get people to think about is that with respect to how you utilize that infrastructure, how you utilize that platform, um, you can take then risks around what you deliver as an end consumer product, right? So you can, you can partner with somebody to provide a different service. You can, you can create a different feature in your vehicle, see if people like to use it. If they don't, you can turn it off, right? Yeah. Um, you, can, you can try things even within the, the vehicle itself, within the, um, the displays that you see in the, in the dashboards. All of those things are possible because all of it's software enabled today. And I think that probably is the single biggest change to driving this, this opportunity, right? That so much of today's um, hardware is really software. And if we categorize, Rich, just a few observations for myself, and they harmonize with what you just shared with us, is if we can break down what is a complex system, something like a vehicle that we're talking about, into the separate components. And you say, yes, yes, we already do that with the engineering today. But I mean, literally break it down from a delivery to the consumer standpoint. To have an MVP of an audio playback system is different than to consider an MVP of autonomous driving systems. Right. Those are something that you can separate. And maybe you can find along these delivery I call them pipelines, just like mm -hmm. when we're thinking about software, these pipelines where you can have some of the things that you can modify now arrive in a drip campaign on today's cycle and have some of the more thing, complex things like autonomous vehicles come out in larger waves, but the consumer's experience is that they're getting something on a regular right. cycle that again, models the delivery of things like mobile phones. Now, Rich, one of the other bits that we've, th we've talked about at dinner the other night was the ability to categorize, though, because the software industry, the pure web apps of the world, if we will, using their attributes is, well, just build a prototype again in a week. I'll keep repeating that phrase. But that may be possible in some areas of the car. What are some of the categorizations that you use? Is there like a risk vector where you can be very experimental here? Is there a complexity where you have two Cooling changes, do you help categorize your work based on those? Yeah, so we look at the, we broadly categorize sort of in two places, right? We would say that we have core work that has to be done, you know, that adheres to safety standards. We can't take much risk there. We believe we have time to get to market. You know, it's not perishable. Um, we have the ability to use our existing processes so we can guarantee certain attributes of what comes out of that. Mm -hmm. We know then it's going to fit into our um, existing deployment processes, right? If we put something in a manufacturing plant, there's expectations that certain things are going to be there, right? Certain levels of support, certain levels of capability, so that we can just mass produce something and, and do it efficiently and, Absolutely. you know, with all the right quality attributes. And then on the other extreme is more of this emerging work where we don't think we have a lot of time, right? Where we do think there's a lot of competition aimed directly at, at the entire precipice. industry. Yeah, and, and, and you can't really wait. I mean, there's a risk of doing nothing, right? There's a risk of taking the full cycle time mm -hmm. and maybe not getting to market with anything. Um, and, and as I mentioned, this creating a, a, 
a relationship with a customer in such a way that they feel like they are going to see improvement and change, and they're going to want to come back in a month maybe and see what the app looks like and see what's new there that they maybe didn't experience a month ago. That's a way of drawing people in and building a relationship that we typically don't have in the automotive industry. I mean, if you think about it, um, the average automotive manufacturer um, in the normal life cycle of a, a customer sale spends about four hours with the person in a nine to 11 year purchase cycle. So we lose a huge chunk of opportunity to interact in any way with, with our true customers. So this is a way of interacting on a much more regular basis. Talk about interaction levels. If you were to take any San Francisco company and ask them about a four-hour interaction over a 10-year usage period <laughs> of, of something or acquisition, uh, I don't even think they'd know how to chart that. But you know, you brought up something that we can zoom in on, uh, which is the software components. We explored so far the challenge that, that faces us with talking about engineers working in physical constraints with devices. Right. But if we zoom in specifically on the software components, we can use some of the best attributes of the most flexible, adaptable, MVP-style approaches of software development for those pieces. Um, Ford has done that, certainly with Ford Pass and also with some of the sync components inside the vehicle, but specifically with your work on this, we've explored this a bit together. Can you tell me a little bit about Ford Pass, and then we can dive into how these techniques apply to it? Sure. So this is, this is really our first um, offering in our um, connected consumer space, and it is um, just... This is, the application is really just the mechanism or the, t the tooling, so to speak, that, to get some engagement with our, our, our end customers. The, the intent of it, though, is to create, an, as I mentioned, an ongoing relationship with the customer. So in the application, you find there are various ways of engagement. So you can talk directly to assistants. You can actually use the, the application to start your vehicle or locate your vehicle. You can find parking. You can pay your bill. You can schedule maintenance, whatever you want to do with, with the app itself. And um, what, we, what our intent was when we put it together is, as I mentioned, to sort of begin to create that ongoing relationship with the customer. And we're using the methodology that we've been talking about, right? So this is an area where we clearly don't have to worry so much about the engineering methodologies that we're used to using at Ford. We can afford to take a risk as to what we put in there. You may find in three months that some of these tabs aren't even on here anymore, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we've instrumented the application in such a way that we'll be able to tell what people are using and what they really like in the app. Um, and if they're not using it, we're just going to take it out. It's just extra complexity for, for the customer, so to speak. Um, so, but the, the beauty of the methodology is we can do this, this testing sort of live with a real consumer base. So we can put it out, and that is our intent right now. We released in April. We had another release that went out um, at the end of May, and we'll have another that goes out um, hopefully next Thursday things go right. Um, but, but the intent then is to cycle fairly quickly through and create additional capability. So it does draw people back in and they want to see what's, what's in the app. Um, and there's a lot in there that, that um, people that don't even have a Ford can use, and that's the intent over time. Initially, we think we can create an installed base through our, our customers, right, that, that use the app to start their vehicle or do those types of functions. And then as we continue to build out capability, we hope others will use the application as well. People will tell their friends, their family, and mm -hmm. it'll grow to the point where they have an opportunity to use this. And it really does, beyond this, um, beyond the vehicle experience, what we're noticing as a company is that people are not always in, in outside of Michigan, you know, it, there, there's different ways of getting around. And people are, are starting to think about ways of transportation that are different than single vehicle ownership. Mm -hmm. And so you'll start to see our um, experiments that we've been doing you know, show up now as offerings that people can use for services so that they can use alternatives to single vehicle ownership to get around. And again, that's just in our view, you know, a customer may live in Michigan, they're taking a trip to New York, and it's not practical now to drive downtown. So they can call for, uh, they can hail a ride or they can share a ride with somebody that's there and they can do it right from from their device. So it becomes an easy way when they think about transportation, they can think about hitting that button. Rich, that's a, that's a great story. And I think some of the components that I derive from this as I'm figuring out the automotive space more and more each month as we work in that as, as GitHub is one, move as many things as possible and are reasonable over to be a software component. And not so that they're just cheaper or that you can cycle quicker, but in fact, it gives you options to be data informed in the decisions that you make in the future. Data informed for vehicle models has got to be one of the most stressful things ever because you put all the knowledge you can into it and then you 
you ship a year's model and you hope that that meets with consumer demand. But in the case of software, your reaction time and cycle to this isn't necessarily met with hit or miss, but it can evolve. And that's a right. slightly different relationship. What I heard you say about the tabs, for example, is that if somebody buys a vehicle and they don't like the metallic paint that you put on it this year, they're not going to roll it down to the local auto body shop and switch that color in a couple months. But that type of same level of change is possible in an application. That's a normal modification. So moving things to be software driven is not just cheaper, faster, but affords you more options to have a more accurate fit with what the consumer's experience wants to be naturally. Exactly right. So having seen this, there's kind of a fun bit that goes with this because we wanted to turn this into a practical example for folks too, to give them vocabulary. We talked about the challenges of engineering and matching that with software, gave you know, really grounded examples and you building the applications that you do for Ford. But one of the patterns here uh, is one of collaboration too. We've talked about the mechanics, but this is humans working together. Right. People working at Ford, and the reason that Ford has the positive reputation it does, is because of the people working there. If you take them out of it, the robots don't necessarily still work themselves as much as we'd like to think that they do, and the software doesn't develop itself when we walk away from our keyboards and laptops. What have you seen as some of the human attributes that have had to transform, and maybe what's reused, what's been useful, from the engineering discipline coming over to the world of software and getting people to collaborate together on solutions? Well, I think um, if we look in particular at the tooling, right, and the processes, so it's clearly people, processes, and tooling that, that get you where you want to go. Standard pillars. The standard pillars. And as you pointed out, you know, it, it is very difficult to get high quality people, but you know, we, we believe you can do that, and we believe we have some of those high quality people. So it's now a matter of how do you, what process do you engage them in, what tooling do you make sure that they have, right? And then when you talk about collaboration, it's really critical, especially in, in projects that are of this scope and that have to turn this quickly around, right? That people can collaborate, right? Mm -hmm. So the processes themselves need to be able to highlight when there is an interdependency, right? And the tooling needs to be able to support that so you can figure it out, whether it's GitHub, which is a good example of a way that you know, we manage interdependencies right, in the code base. Um, but though that, that process discipline comes from the engineering, right? The, the, the ability to version control, manage the release of something, that concept comes from there. So you still want to use that concept, right? But the collaborative nature of it, and especially when you're doing this stuff globally, you don't have necessarily the option of sitting everybody in the singular room and, and you know, having them communicate over their shoulders. So the tooling, exactly. I would say, is very, very important to this. So all, all three of those, those things matter. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're, yeah, here we go. And you know, I think in, in particular the two that, are, that, well, all three are very, very important, but the two that we've been focusing on the most are the process piece of it. You know, how do we get that agility through very extreme agile type programming methods? And then what tooling do we need to support our team? Right? And so you'd ask me before, what, would, what advice would I give? Right? And I think the first one is you do just have to get started. Right? You have to jump in. You have to make a commitment you're going to try it. Um, we started with our experiments. You saw a couple examples of those previously where we, we didn't have an offering in the field. So we, there wasn't really much to lose. Right? Um, we made sure we, we understood. We cooperated with people who know, other experts in the field who are doing this type of development work. Mm -hmm. We've tried to leverage their, their expertise and their, their experience in this area. And we tried to make sure our teams always have the right tooling so that you know, sometimes you put people into a situation where they know the right thing to do, but they don't have the tooling. They don't have the capacity to get it done. So in, in my view, if we could you know, get going with it, make sure you are empowering your people and you're, you're, you're looking at the cultural change. It's a big shift in mindset to people who've been developing, even, even traditional software development's a big shift, um, and make sure they've got the cap capability in terms of tooling to get the job done so they're not frustrated. Well, Rich, what I, what I heard in that, and it's interesting because, again, even outside of the automotive industry, talking to a bank this morning in my work with GitHub and uh, talking to somebody in retail just the other day last week, the piece that, that is really important to understand is that it is humans creating software, just like it was Absolutely. humans coming up with the design for the engineering hardware components of a vehicle. And without the right tools, you can have the right ingredients, but they kind of, they kind of just bounce around in a box. They don't actually connect. They don't actually produce the work. And the tooling is a way to make that efficient. So in many cases, just like I'd imagine a practitioner you know, cutting wood or doing milling of, of, of metal and having the right CNC machines, having the right tools is important in the software space. And it's something that Rich and I talked again about the other night at dinner. That's a necessary ingredient 
but it is not sufficient. And sufficient means that you have domain expertise. It's why it's really important that we've been talking about retooling some of the people are, that are in the automotive industry to give them the right tools, to give them the techniques from places like Silicon Valley, but to have them use their amazing domain knowledge to still achieve the results that we need. If someone doesn't understand how a car works, it's rather presumptuous of them to say, oh, I can write a new dashboard for a vehicle, but they don't understand that people are holding onto a steering wheel and they're occasionally just glancing over to touch the screen or where it's convenient. So of this, do you think that, um, do you think this is basically a balance? I heard it, but I want to make yeah, sure that I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, I think it's very much a balance. You, you absolutely have to have the people and, and you need to support the people in terms of the cultural change they're going to go through. You have to have the process and the process discipline and, and maybe the experience of other people to help you through that. And then you need a tool, tooling as well. So it is very much a balanced, balanced need. Well, Rich, I think that was a fantastic tour of hardware, the world of automotive, uh, transformation over to a software development world, how you just get started by putting something out there and evolving it based on the data that comes back from the field, making sure that it matches consumer needs as the end driver and evolving towards what they're giving you feedback. And that's true of the vehicles and the apps inside them and the apps on our phones that talk to them. So for that, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate Maybe we can take uh, one question about in the time that we have left, if there's one burning one, and then we'll uh, timely conclude. Any hands, any shout outs for questions? Does it really work? I see two questions here. Uh, one, just shout it out if there's a question. Does anybody have a question? There's one right, there's one hand right there. Oh, right. okay. Do you want to oh, oh perfect. Right here too. Um, let me talk about the, let's, let's grab the, the last one. Um, I think that's the most interesting, being mindful of the time. What, what non-traditional automobile products and services are you building in Ford Pass? Rich, that's right up your alley. Okay, so some examples of things we're trying to do, we, we've basically run experiments globally, and most of them are in highly dense um, urban areas, and that's where traditional single vehicle ownership doesn't really make a lot of sense. So what we've been doing are uh, experiments around both things like ride hailing, so calling for a vehicle when you need one, ride sharing, offering to share rides or pick up on a shared ride if you need one, car sharing, so for instance, you, you may need a vehicle or you may use a, a transportation service during the week to get around, but on the weekend you need to go pick something up and you would then like to have a pickup truck or something like that. So we can actually share ownership or pass short-term ownership from one person to another. Another is uh, something we call a, a dynamic shuttle, and essentially there was a picture of that earlier in the, in the slides, and that's a, a hybrid between basically a bus and something like an Uber experience. So it's much less expensive, but gives you door-to-door -door drop up and drop off and pick up, and um, can be hailed directly from something like that app. So we would expect to see all those services start popping up in the application. Traditional automotive products, as we build more features into the vehicle that can be enabled through the mobile app, you'll absolutely see them come through Ford Pass. I think that's cool. And in a lot of ways, if you take it back from the, the whole lesson that we wanted to share with you for this, that's enabled by having the data from software so that you can make adjustments to those rollouts of those services, not just a one and done, fire and forget, hope it works, but a constant evolution where it makes economic sense and you're rolling out the products to the markets that have the appetite for them. Absolutely. I think that's neat. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause.